All right. Good morning. Just want to welcome everyone. My name is Troy Duggar with the Center for Profit Agriculture and to our series of especially crop meetings that we're having. This is the third of the four uh, that we have have planned uh, this morning. Again, we're glad to have Dr. David Lockwood with us to talk about uh, berries, strawberries, uh, blueberries and blackberries and, and Les Humple, who's going to also going to have some things about the economics and, and budgeting on uh, these crops as well. So uh, thank you for signing up for the agents that did and those that are online with us. We had uh, several more uh, that have signed up. Uh, well, I don't know if we're in some, we may be in competition with the search uh, committee this morning with what's going on with the assistant dean position, maybe or maybe not, but we're glad to have everybody here today. Our fourth one in this series will be January the 13th at 9 a.m. on uh, Tree Nuts. Uh, Dr. Lockwood will be with us once again for, for that. If you have not signed up in Super, uh, please do so. Uh, we'll begin the link out to that uh, a little bit before that, that meeting time. Um, we're working on this project with, and, and talked to some of you about uh, doing some county meetings as well, and um, mostly in March, late February and March. Um, this is all through a special crop block grant through uh, Tennessee Department of Agriculture. Uh, Debbie Ball has been working with us on that. I don't, she was on the last call. I don't think she's on here with us today. If she does join, I may give her a moment to, to speak in a, in a little bit. But uh, again, glad to have everybody on that is on with us and appreciate time from Dr. Lockwood and, and Les Humple for uh, helping us today. Uh, if you've got questions, if you want to put those in the chat box, we'll try to take care of those or you can save them to the end. Uh, we'll try to address those at the very end. Uh, I will have just, a, again, a very simple evaluation I'll send out uh, to those in attendance for about today's uh, session. So with all that being said, uh, Dr. Lockwood, thank you for being here today. I know we had a We've been doing some visits in and around Middle Tennessee and a program last night at UT Southern. Uh, so appreciate him being on the on the call today. And I'm going to turn it to Dr. Lockwood to get us started this morning. Okay. Well, thank you, Troy. Thanks, sir. All right. Hopefully this is going to work. Okay. Looks like we got it. Got it. Yes, sir. Well, good morning, everybody. It's uh, good to be here. As, as Troy said, we've been making some good visits in Middle Tennessee and uh, had an enjoyable and, and hopefully productive week. Uh, I certainly benefited from it. So today we want to talk about strawberries, blackberries, and blueberries. Uh, we'll start off in the order they're listed. Uh, I would appreciate any feedback, any thoughts you might have, and uh, uh, any questions that may come up, we'll do our best to address them. So with that being said, we'll start off on some general stuff. Uh, you know, I, I always like to try to point out some of the unique aspects of fruit production as compared to other crops, because there are some things that um, differ radically and, and maybe entail some uh, longer range planning in some cases. So with fruit crops, we've got challenges in that we've got in most cases plants that live in fruit for many years and what you do this year is going to have an impact on the performance of the plant in the coming years uh, be it good or bad you may have a lag time in fact you do have a lag time in most of the fruit crops between the time you set the crop and you get your first yield so uh, it, that'll vary depending on what the crop is, what the variety is. In some cases, if you've got a grafted plant, the rootstock will impact it, as well the cultural practices. And we'll see that uh, when we get into the strawberries uh, right off the bat. Another thing that we see for most of our fruit crops, the fruit buds are formed during the summer of the previous year. So if you get a year like we had in East Tennessee this year, where we lost most of our fruit crop due to a frost on April 22nd, you really can't just turn your back on the planting and walk away because not only do you lose the current year's crop, but you stand a good chance of losing a, a goodly portion of next year's crop. So it's kind of a, um, once you get it, get it going, you're kind of obligated to stay with it uh, just to get the best returns on the crop year after year. 
it's also in, uh, important to realize that the highest yields and quality of a crop are formed during the time of fruit bud initiation. And everything that happens from that point on tends to either reduce the size or the quality. And as a grower, it's our challenge to maintain uh, as high a, a fruit bud survival and uh, quality potential as we can throughout the year and on up until harvest. Another thing that uh, is quite unique to fruit crops is that early growth of the plant and the crop in spring are directly related to the health of that plant as it went into dormancy the previous fall. And so we want to make sure that we take care of the plants all the way from uh, bud break or be, uh, before bud break all the way up until natural leaf fall due to frost because we're building the ability of that plant to tolerate the stresses of winter and also to get off to a strong start in the spring, which will have a definite impact on fruit set and early fruit growth. So again, care should extend throughout the season. Now, uh, I rated on this slide, the small fruit crops in regards to ease of pest control. And blueberries for years have been kind of our number one crop. That is, uh, most of our blueberry plantings were grown without any pesticide use at all. If anything was used, that may have been uh, something for Japanese beetle. But that all changed in 2012 when the spotted wing Drosophila showed up in East Tennessee. And now if you're in an area where you've had spotted wing and if you, you uh, identify it in the planting, you really are, are uh, need to be spraying starting about two weeks prior to your first anticipated harvest and spray on a, a sprayed at all now may require as much as eight to 12 pesticide applications depending on the type of blueberry and the varieties that you have. So I've switched muscadines around and, and put them a little bit easier to grow than blueberries if you are in an area uh, where muscadines will tolerate winter low temperatures. And most, of course, of, of Tennessee is. There are some areas on the plateau in Upper East Tennessee where uh, we won't suggest muscadines simply because cold injury is too frequent a problem. So as we have, uh, as we go down the list, you can see that uh, uh, grapes become the most difficult possibly because they're there the longest. We have a lot of insects and diseases that can affect grapes and uh, that crop is out there a long time from bud break until harvest. So uh, it, it becomes more challenging. Now also when we uh, are thinking about putting out fruits, I, I really like to stress the, the need for site selection because it's going to affect everything that happens in the planting and in the marketing of the fruit that comes from the planting. So uh, if you're going to do pick your own, if you're going to do on-farm marketing, of course, you've got to be relatively accessible to your customer base. You know, how far are you from them? Uh, how easy is it to get to the farm? How many turns? What's the quality of the roads? What the, what's the parking situation once they get there? All of those things are important because if you can't get the customers out there, of course, uh, you're not going to be successful in the venture. Once we get beyond that, we start looking at aspects of the, the site and its impact on uh, uh, the actual production of the crop. All of our small fruit crops need full sun. Uh, and full sun is, is uh, defined as eight hours or longer. I prefer, if I had a choice, I prefer morning sun over afternoon. I like the plants to dry off early in the morning, uh, less disease pressure. And of course, uh, that's, uh, and in the afternoon, as you get into the middle of the day and uh, early afternoon, in summers, a lot of times we see a midday decline in photosynthesis simply because of heat. So full sun, but pay special attention to that morning sun. Elevation is another thing we look at. And here we're talking about elevation in regards to the surrounding land. Uh, in a, a radiation frost event, you always see a frost starting in the low areas. And then depending on the intensity of the frost, the duration of frost, you'll see it further and further up a slope. So with a radiation frost event, kind of a rule of thumb that we hear a lot 
is that for every 100 feet increase in elevation, you can expect to see about five to 10 degrees Fahrenheit increase in temperature as you go up that slope. We've seen this happen where uh, we, uh, if we had a, a crop planted all the way from the basal part of the slope on up to the top, uh, you may lose the crop entirely at the bottom and not see any frost uh, damage at all uh, in the higher parts of the slope. So elevation is a primary thing to look at. It also has a positive impact on disease. If you have fogs, uh, then or heavy dew, uh, that lower ground is going to stay wet longer. And of course, that's more favorable for disease development. Once we select that, uh, direction of slope can have an impact, although it's kind of a fine tuning. But an east facing slope dries off uh, earlier in the morning, as we talked about just a while ago. And I like that aspect. A south facing slope will give you earlier harvest, but realize that soils on the south slope tend to be thinner. They have lower organic matter. They're more drought prone. Uh, the plants on that south facing slope is also, are also more prone to winter injury and spring frost damage uh, because the, uh, the uh, direction of the sun or the sun strike the, the plants at a more direct raise and you get more, uh, more heating. As far as soils go, almost all of our fruit crops, with the exception of blueberries, perform best uh, soil pH of between 6 and 6.5. For blueberry, ideally, we're looking at 4.8 to 5.2. So uh, if a grower is wanting to put out uh, several small fruit crops, one of the things that I suggest is that they make sure they have a, a plan as to where they want to plant the individual crops. Uh, before they do anything. You don't want to go in and, and lime a field and then decide that is where you want to put the blueberries because now you've got to undo what you just tried to accomplish by liming. And that's not easy to accomplish. Uh, as a rule, fairly high organic matter, we're talking 2% or so for most fruit crops is good. Organic matter gives kind of a buffer against uh, nutrient issues. Uh, plants will go well. In blueberry, we would like to see 3% or higher. Uh, the higher the organic matter for blueberry, uh, the better off you are. And it's gotten to the point where in some areas further south, they're growing blueberries in 100% pine bark, uh, not soil, but uh, mulch around, around the plant. Uh, I don't necessarily think that's essential here, but the higher the organic matter, the better off you're going to be. All fruit crops, need well-drained soils. They won't tolerate water logging uh, for any time during the growing season. And so good internal and surface drainage are essential. Uh, I like to see a minimum of 30, 36 inches of rooting depth. So although that is deeper than the uh, bulk of the root area on most of these plants, there will be some roots on many of these that get on down and the more uh, area that the root system can establish in, the more tolerant the plant will be of stresses. Now, something that's unique to fruits that we don't think about, or it seems contrary actually, is that a moderate to low fertility soil actually is more desirable than a highly fertile soil. And the reason for that is that with uh, the higher fertility, we have more vegetative growth, the more vigorous the plant's growing, the longer it's going to take it to initiate fruit buds. And once it does start to fruit, the poorer the quality of the fruit will be. If you've got a real dense canopy, for example, on a grapevine, you have a lot of internal shading. Uh, you actually get shading to the point that you won't get fruit bud development on the interior of the canopy. As you move out into partial shade, uh, you'll find that the fruit quality suffers as a result of shade lower sugar levels, lower color. Uh, so if you're on high fertility, you don't have control of the plant that you do have if it's a low to moderately fertile soil where you can adjust how much fertilizer and when you put that fertilizer down. And then, of course, water, both how much water and water quality we're looking at because uh, especially as we get into some more intense production, irrigation is gonna become the best insurance policy that you can have. 
timely applications of water just for drought control can result in bigger fruit, extended harvest, and of course, better growth of the plant for next year's crop as well. In addition to that, in, in some cases, we elect to use overhead irrigation uh, for frost protection, and that takes a lot of water. And then the final thing I put on this list is wildlife damage potential, uh, because we're seeing more and more problems with wildlife. Uh, we were in an orchard yesterday where one block had uh, severe deer damage. And uh, we were in a block the day before where the grower had put up a, a very nice deer fence and had, uh, had cut the, the problems he was having with deer grazing in the planting way down. Uh, I'm not saying that everybody needs to have deer fencing or netting for bird control, but it's important to realize that it may be needed and it could be a, a worthwhile budgeting for that up front so that you're not blindsided when you see the need. As we grow fruit, uh, almost any green crop, essentially we're harvesting the sun. Uh, sunlight is the key to fruit production. and, and uh, so. I, I put this slide in because it kind of is what we like to avoid. Uh, I'm standing on a hill looking down into this vineyard and it's about four o'clock in the afternoon and you can see how much of the vineyard is shaded. Uh, in the morning, of course, it's gonna be just the opposite. Not only do we have a lot of shade in there, but we've also got beautiful habitat for deer, for turkeys, for birds. This is our vineyard was eight years old and he'd never harvested a crop out of it. So we need to make sure that we look at aspects of site uh, to and the impact it can have on fruiting. So with that being said, we'll start off on strawberry. Um, it's one of the uh, favorites around the state. And um, maybe you did or maybe you didn't know that back in the 50s, Tennessee was uh, number one strawberry producing state in the nation. And I've seen some, uh, some records that say we had at that time about 26,000 acres of strawberries across the state. There were three or four major production areas uh, out in West Tennessee around Fruitland up north of Jackson. The area up north of uh, Nashville and Portland was one. Another one down close to Chattanooga and the Sail Creek area was uh, another. And uh, so we had a lot of strawberries, but of course with, with labor, uh, other areas of the country took over and uh, other areas that had less disease problems too. But we grow two basic types of strawberry plants or can grow two types in Tennessee. Uh, as a, uh, we lump them together into June bearing or day neutral plants, a June bearing strawberry plant sets fruit buds in response to day length or night length regardless or depending on which way you want to refer it. But uh, what we'll see, excuse me, for, just jumping ahead. What we'll see with June bearing plants is uh, a heavy production over a short period of time, generally from two to five weeks, depending on variety, uh, you're gonna have a fairly significant production. And varieties that are used for this include the Early Glow and All Star, which we use in Matted Row, and Chandler and Camarosa, which are quite common in plastic culture. The day neutral strawberry plants are not responsive to the length of the night or day period. They'll set fruit buds regardless of, of uh, dark periods. They will not form a lot of fruit buds in the uh, high heat part of the summer, but they, they'll fruit quite uh, over quite a long period of time. So we use them a lot for season extension. If you're going to grow in high tunnels or a greenhouse, they, uh, they can give you continuous fruiting when temperatures are up between about 40 and 80, 85 degrees. Uh, and they can outproduce the June bears over the entire season, although you won't get that uh, major or that big crop within that confined two to five week period. We grow day neutral plants uh, quite often as annuals. And uh, by doing that, we can eliminate a lot of disease pressure. Varieties that we see, Albion right now is probably the most common. Seascape and San Andreas are a couple other day neutrals that are being grown or tried in the state. 
So if we look at the June bearing strawberries, uh, the two ways we grow them are either the matted row culture, which is the way we've always grown strawberries, and plastic culture. And with a matted row culture, uh, we'll set the plants in the spring of the year and we won't let them fruit that first year. We'll go through and pull blooms because uh, we're gonna be setting the plants at relatively wide spacings and then uh, we want them to run to fill in the rows. And if we let them fruit some, then we're gonna cut back on runner production and that's gonna cost us yield in that first crop year, a year after planting. You can get a lot of fruit off of uh, matted row plants. Uh, here we say about 25 plants can give you over 40 pounds the year following planting. <clears throat> and again, uh, early grow still is probably the most common uh, variety in matted row production. We try to use a couple of varieties uh, to extend harvest season. Early grow comes in early, has nice fruit, but the size will taper off as you get into production. And so if you have a, a mid-season plant similar to like All Star, uh, you can extend that harvest season uh, significantly. So the first year we set the plants, we allow them to run, uh, and then we're gonna fruit them a year after. And this just shows uh, shots of early grow and All Star. Very good quality berries. Uh, the customers really like them. The flavor's good. The yields are good. Uh, and they've maintained their lead or their dominance as far as the varieties for quite a few years now. So with that matted growth system, uh, like I said, we set the plants in the spring, space them about 18, 24 inches apart in the row. And the rows will be spaced somewhere around 48 inches apart, depending on the equipment that the grower has to take care of the planting. And the idea is that we want to force the plant to run. And it will run, but if we let it bloom, it's going to cut down on runner production. So if we set our plants, like I said, 18, 24 inches apart, and we have good cultural practices, good weather, we'll get a, a good runner production, and we'll end up with a planting that's going to be filled, uh, similar to what you see in this diagram. So on the, the left side is planting, on the right side is where that row is filled in. The dark green are the plants we set, and the light green being the runner plants. And this just shows a field of uh, uh, matted row berries uh, that's uh, going into the, the first production. So we've had plenty of runner plants, we've filled in the rows, we've still got very defined <coughs> access areas uh, to walk through the planting, the harvest, and also for light penetration. And that's one of the things that uh, we don't necessarily take uh, recognize enough, but the better sunlight that we have, the better fruiting we have. And a lot of times we'll see better quality berries on the outsides or the edges of the row than we will in the middle, primarily because of light. Depending on, on weather, cultural practices, uh, we may be able to get three or four harvests out of a uh, planting before uh, our yields start to decline and uh, we need to reestablish. <coughs> Each year after harvest, we go in and renovate the plants and renovation is important to do. Strawberries go into a semi-dormant stage shortly after harvest. At that time, we go in and uh, we try to get rid of some of the plants and we mow off the plants. We'll work the sides of the rows to narrow down the row uh, and we'll go ahead and, and fertilize based on soil test at that time, light nitrogen and, and uh, focus on P and K, irrigate to stimulate growth and runner production. And of course, we're gonna be looking at weed control throughout the season. If we do a good job there and then we, uh, we'll get good runner production, we'll come back in August and side dress with nitrogen because that's when fruit bud development is occurring. <clears throat> and we'll be set up to go into uh, the winter with a fairly good quality planting. During the winter uh, on the uh, June bearers, the matted row plants, mulching is good. Uh, mulches will delay somewhat bud break. It'll protect the plant from cold somewhat. 
Uh, it'll also give you a cleaner area to grow the fruit on, but it's important to delay application of mulch until after the plants are fully dormant. So we're looking up in December, usually before mulches are put on. And a mulch, a good mulch for strawberries is, is a nice clean straw. Uh, it, it won't pack down, it won't mat down and suffocate the plants. Uh, it'll stay there and it'll help suppress weed growth and we'll do the job. So we'll put the mulch down uh, over the plants, over the row middles uh, in December. Uh, and then as we start to get blooming in the spring, we'll pull some of the, the heavier mulch off the plants out in the row middles to give us better weed control. So we've got a, a mulch now that it's helping to uh, suppress weeds, give us clean berries, it reduces soil splash on the fruit, which is very good from a food safety standpoint. And of course, gives a whole lot more pleasant place to work. And this again is at that same field uh, just prior to harvest. And you can see the uh, high number of blooms in there. This grow grower has it set up for irrigation for frost protection. Um, and we are using some irrigation for frost protection, but we see more and more growers looking at row covers as opposed to water for frost protection. And you might use one or maybe two row covers. That is two light row covers will give you better frost protection than one heavier row cover. And they're better than water in some cases in that, of course, if you water much, if you have to irrigate much, you're irrigate, uh, aggravating disease uh, problems. So uh, we'll move from there into the annual or plastic culture production. In uh, plastic culture, this is an annual cropping system. Well, we'll set plants closely spaced on a raised bed. And on that raised bed, we'll have a trickle irrigation line and then we'll cover the bed with black plastic. <clears throat> As opposed to the matted row system, with plastic culture, we set in the fall of the year. And depending on where you are in Tennessee, anywhere from about mid-September to mid-October is the window that we look at to set our plants. We don't want to set too early because the plants will start to run and that, that's going to cost us some problems. We also don't want to set too late because if the plants are not fully established in the planting, frost can heave some of them out of the ground. So it's kind of a crapshoot as to what time, exact time you end up planting because uh, unless you can predict the weather in the fall better than what I can, uh, I, I would just have to kind of choose the date and hope for the best, I think. But uh, we'll use either uh, plug plants or, or uh, root plants or, or cuts uh, and we'll set them in the fall. Most of the plants that we're getting are coming in out of uh, Nova Scotia uh, simply because of disease problems are less. But uh, we need to get good quality plants from a reputable source, uh, set them and then get, uh, get them established. Now we're using drip irrigation under the plastic. So it might be uh, when you set the plants, you run the irrigation to kind of settle that plant and get the roots, uh, uh, roots all contact established. We shouldn't have to do much fertilization because we're gonna be adjusting the soils at the time we build the beds. The varieties that we see most often Chandler's been the dominant variety in plastic culture for years, and it still is. But Camarosa, Sweet Charlie, and now there's some other newer varieties that are being tried too. <coughs> Why do we use plastic culture versus matted roll? Well, one thing that we were kind of forced into it actually uh, several years ago, anthracnose became a real problem and we were setting uh, plants in the spring of the year. And over that first summer, we were losing a high percentage of the plant. So uh, we never had a good field to go into our first harvest. By setting in the fall, we've got less time for anthracnose to develop. It's still a, a threat. We see it every year, uh, but nowhere near the extent that it used to be. Also with plastic culture, our yield potential is higher than with matted row, and we do see an extended harvest season. So we'll, we'll uh, build the beds, set the plants, crop them, and then destroy the planting. Many growers will use that raised bed uh, for say a late tomato crop or pumpkins or something like that. 
uh, so they can double crop those beds. The bed that we use in, in plastic culture, generally somewhere around eight to 10 inches in height, it needs to be slightly crowned, ideally so water is gonna shed from the bed. The bed width at the top will be about 36 inches. <coughs> and uh, the uh, center of the bed, from the center of one bed to the next uh, row center of the bed is about five feet, again, depending on equipment. But we'll raise, build that raised bed, cover it with uh, later trickle line, cover it with plastic. And here you can see the, the machine that's uh, shaping the bed, laying the trickle, putting the plastic down and actually poking holes in the plastic where we'll follow back and plant through. We we'll use two rows of, of plants about a foot apart and the plants will be 12 to 14 inches apart in a row, but we stagger those rows on top of the bed. And you can see uh, here a little bit further after uh, the planting, you can see the, the two rows and the plants being somewhat staggered. Uh, again, light is critical, and that's why we use the spacings that we use uh, to give us plenty of sunlight and for fruit quality and high yields. Harvest uh, will be earlier in plastic culture, primarily because of the raised bed and the black plastic, we warm the soil. Uh, and so we'll get and the varieties. We'll get into production a little bit ahead and we may extend harvest beyond what we see with matted row. So advantages of plastic culture over matted row uh, in organic, I think are significant uh, because you have the plants there for a, a much shorter period of time, about eight months to 10 months from the time you set till the time you destroy them as opposed to trying to carry a planting over for several years in matted row. So weed issues are a whole lot less. Uh, also disease pressures a lot less. We don't carry over diseases from one year to the next because we're gonna crop the planting and then destroy it. And our new planting will be put in in a separate site. <coughs> Pardon me, I'm trying to get over a cold. Strawberries are uh, susceptible to frost, just like other fruit crops. And uh, this slide shows the, the critical temperatures at different stages of bud development. So when that strawberry is in the tight bud stage, about 22 degrees Fahrenheit is considered critical. So if you had a lot of tight buds in there and it was gonna get into the low 20s or higher teens, you ought to be putting on some type of frost protection. Now the, the plant, the blossom loses its hardiness quickly as it develops. So as we go into a popcorn stage where the bloom is starting to open, but not fully open, you can see that 28 degrees is considered critical. Uh, much, much more susceptible to cold than it was at that uh, tight bud stage. And at open bloom, we see 30 degrees is uh, uh, the critical temperature. So strawberry is quite susceptible to cold and a grower needs to be looking at site selection as well as cultural practices and the ability to frost protect to be consistently successful in their production. The day neutral varieties I mentioned earlier, Albion is, is probably the most common one right now. Seascape is another, uh, but uh, they are good berries. And uh, we're seeing those uh, in, in uh, some of our tunnels and in some of the uh, uh, greenhouse production. Uh, they fruit over a longer period of time. One thing to keep in mind, if a person wants to grow in a, a structure uh, and off season, you've got to be concerned with things like pollination. Uh, bees don't, honeybees don't like to work in a tunnel. So pollination becomes a challenge. You may have to order uh, bumblebees to bring in to, uh, to pollinate, but you can grow good quality fruit out of the normal uh, time season and create a, a real market advantage for yourself in many cases. And this is uh, a shot taken inside a high tunnel, no frost or, or uh, or heating, no cooling or heating in here, other than opening the doors or rolling up the sides. If it should get real cold, they will put down row covers over the plant. But this picture was taken on December 20th. The variety was one called uh, Strawberry Festival. 
And actually the last harvest out of this uh, tunnel was uh, middle January. Uh, so it is a way to extend the season if, if uh, that would fit into the market th that the grower is looking at. So let's move on into cane berries and primarily blackberries. When we talk about cane berries, uh, we used to call them brambles, but that term is not accurate or as accurate now as it used to be because in blackberry production, the majority of the new varieties that we're getting are thornless and brambles just means the, the presence of thorns. Uh, blackberry is a much happier crop in Tennessee than raspberry. And therefore uh, I spend most of my time talking about blackberry production, it's much more feasible. Raspberry, perhaps if you were in, up on the plateau or in the higher regions of East Tennessee would be more feasible. But in, in a lot of Tennessee, uh, raspberries are not gonna be a, a, that high a yielding crop. But with blackberries, we've got a lot of new uh, varieties and a lot of potential. The plant itself is kind of interesting in that the root system of a blackberry is a perennial. It'll live for many years. And depending on the type of, of blackberry, uh, whether it's an erect or semi-erect uh, or a, uh, a trailing blackberry, new canes will arise from different places on the plant. On the erect blackberry, new canes arise from buds at the base of the old canes and from root buds. So if you set out an erect blackberry, and incidentally, all the primocane bearers, the fall bearers, are erect varieties. But if you saw, set out an erect blackberry, you're going to see a lot of new canes coming up uh, in between where you set plants because they're coming off of buds on the root system. Whereas if you set a uh, trailing or semi-erect blackberry, all the new canes rise from the uh, buds at the base of the old canes, and they'll stay confined to that planting hill. The top part of a, a blackberry is biennial. That is, it's got a two-year lifespan. Most of the varieties, the first year, which we call the primocane year, is just a year for the cane to grow. The second year, we refer to it as the floricane year because that's the year that the flowers appear, or the fruit appears, and then the cane dies. So that's the typical uh, blackberry growth pattern. We've got a, a difference in uh, the primocane fruiters we'll talk about in just a minute. In addition to uh, the erect, semi-erect, and trailing, you've also got Thorn versus thornless. Uh, thorn berries are still not out of the picture. They're not being used as much, but there are some good varieties out there of thorn variety, uh, thorn blackberries. Uh, and then, as I mentioned earlier, you got primary cane or floor cane fruiting. Some varieties will fruit the first year that cane grows. And generally, they're going to fruit in the upper third of a cane. Uh, and that fruiting may occur anywhere from, say, uh, latter part of July all the way up until frost. And then that part of the cane will die back. If you're in an area where you get good yields off of that fall crop, then many of the growers grow it just for the fall crop. That is, they'll come in in the winter, mow off the whole planting, and start it all over. It, uh, it saves a lot of pruning. However, in hotter areas, we don't get as good a fall yield as we'd like. And so by coming in after we get the fall harvest and pruning back to healthy wood, we can get an early summer harvest off the lower part of the canes. And so some of these prime cane fruiters are being used not only for the fall crop, but as an introduction to blackberry uh, earlier in the summer than what the traditional varieties do. So this is just a summary of what we talked about uh, before. Uh, floricane versus primocane bearing. Uh, most blackberries are floricane bearing. If you go into raspberries, the black and purple raspberries and some red and yellow raspberries are floricane bearing. If you look at primocane bearing, there are some blackberries that bear fall crops as do some of the reds and yellow raspberries. This slide shows most of the, uh, the more common uh, varieties that are out there right now. On the thornless floor cane bearing, 
Uh, Washita is probably the dominant variety right now. It's actually probably the most widely planted blackberry in the world. Incidentally, any of these that have Indian tribe names, like all of those listed here, except Vaughn and Triple Crown, came out of the University of Arkansas breeding program. So Osage is, is uh, uh, newer than Washita. It's a little bit later. You can extend the season a few days. Caddo is a new variety. Ponca is a new release. And, and John Clark, the breeder in Arkansas that released uh, all of these, says it's the sweetest blackberry that he's ever had. So that's one that uh, we encourage people to try to see if it might work for them. Vaughn is out of North Carolina State. Uh, and it does a good job in, in many parts of, of the Southeast. Triple Crown is a USDA release uh, from Maryland. We see some of that, although not a lot of it. Triple Crown is a little bit later, so it, it is used some to extend our harvest somewhat. Kiowa is a thorned fluorocane bearer, and we still see it planted because it has very, very large berries and quite high quality berries. Uh, and one thing we noticed uh, in 2020, where we had the uh, late frost, Kiowa came through better than almost any of the other blackberries with a crop. Uh, so that's a, a something to keep in mind. And then if we look at the primocane bearing, that is the fall bearers, uh, Primark 45 is, is quite uh, good, but it's thorned. Uh, Primark Freedom and Primark Traveler are good fall bearers and they're thornless. And since uh, after I made this slide, uh, they released a new one called Primark Horizon. Uh, it's a good berry. It's thorned, but the reason it was released is that it is extremely high yielding. Uh, some of the trials uh, show about 30,000 pounds per acre yield if you combine fall and spring. Uh, so it's, it's considerably higher than the others. So with cane berries, uh, if it's floor cane berry, uh, when a grower plants the plants, they're not gonna get anything that first year, but if they do a good job and weather conditions are favorable, they can expect as much as 60 to 100% of a crop that second year. I've seen that happen in, in uh, a couple of cases where uh, they were at full cropping that first time they had fruit on the plant. The uh, projected life of a planting is going to vary depending on weather and cultural practices, but normally we're saying about six to eight years. And, and you know, records are going to tell you when, when does fruit size start to drop off, when do yields start to drop. If a person is in blackberry production, uh, long term, then I think by the time that planting is, is somewhere in the neighborhood of uh, five to six years of age, you ought to be putting in another planting so that you can cycle uh, from the old into that new without a lag in production. For the fluorocane bearing varieties, uh, the ones that I've listed will be picking blackberries from about mid-June on through the month of July. If we grow primocane bearers, uh, the fall crop will come in beginning mid or late July and go all the way to frost. If we save it for uh, the early summer crop, then we'll start to pick in early to mid June. Uh, the figures down here on expected yields are on the very low side. Uh, I mentioned uh, Primark Horizon, 30,000 pounds. I would be putting uh, these other varieties probably somewhere realistically in the 10 to 12,000 pound per acre yield uh, projection. You can go above that. I mean, to, and I wouldn't be surprised if somebody said they got 20,000 pounds per acre, but if I were planning and doing the budgeting, I would not budget on that. This shows the timeline of caneberry production. Again, what we do to get the site selected and prepared is going to be very important. It's going to influence how the planting does. And also, at this time, uh, getting good plants is going to be important. So uh, that pre-plant time is, is where we need to be running down a good source of plants. And if it were possible, I'd like to plant virus-indexed tissue-cultured varieties because you're going to be sure 
that you've got the variety that you want and that you've got clean plant stock to start with. Uh, but if you don't buy directly from somebody that does that, make sure you buy from a nursery that does have a very good reputation. Uh, Norse Farms is one that we use a lot up in uh, New England. Indiana Berry uh, has given us good plants. There are some others, but realize that, that you want to go into the field with as good a plant as you can possibly get. Uh, this is a slide that was taken up in Kentucky, but uh, what uh, I put it in here to show that if you plant an erect or even a, uh, a semi-erect plant, uh, that first year, you're going to think that this, the nursery made a mistake and set you trailing varieties. So the upper left-hand picture shows a variety that's actually an erect thornless plant, but it's running on the ground. That same planting the second year is starting to come erect. And, the, and that's shown in the lower right hand side. So I realize that there is a, a difference from that first year uh, and succeeding years. Uh, before I forget to mention it, we put a, uh, a blackberry planting in at the uh, uh, Middle Tennessee Research and, and uh, Education Center in May this past year. We've got 11 varieties and five different training systems. Uh, and so if you're in that area, uh, that's something that if you've got an interest in blackberries, it might be worth your time to stop and look at. We talk a lot about primocanes and floricanes and how, how do you tell the difference? Well, uh, first off, the, the primocane, which is shown on the left side of this slide, is going to be lighter green in color. It's going to be more vigorous and the leaf structure is going to be different than what you see on the floricane. So the cane in the foreground of this is a primocane, and then you can see the floricane, darker green, less vigor, and of course the presence of fruit on the right-hand side. Trellising is an important part of blackberry production. We need to have these plants up where they can be well exposed to sunlight, good air penetration, good spray penetration. The better job we do, the easier it is to grow, and the better fruit we grow. Uh, so we want to get a good trellis, uh, and we want to have a plant that's well-trained. It's going to be a whole lot easier to manage. Uh, and uh, what we'll end up doing now an erect plant, theoretically, you wouldn't have to trellis it. But the crop load that we put on them and the height that we're suggesting that we grow the plants, I think a trellis is worthwhile, regardless of what type of blackberry you're growing. So this slide just shows some of uh, the trellises from the eye trellis in the upper left side, which is the easiest or most basic and cheapest trellis, on down to the T or Y trellis uh, on the left bottom and over to the rotating cross on, on the right bottom. The eye trellis is, like I said, the least expensive. Uh, I don't care for it as much because with it, you've got primocanes and floricanes all competing for the same space. Uh, light relations within the canopy are not as good. It's not as easy to harvest. The berry quality potentially is not as good. If we go down to the T or Y trellis below that, uh, you can see that, uh, now this is actually a raspberry planting, but the blackberry would look the same. We, in the winter, we've taken the canes that will fruit uh, and pulled them over to the side of that T and secured them to that side wire. And by doing that, we create a V uh, shape in the plant. In the spring of the year, we get bloom, we get cropping on the edges of the trellis, and we have the center open for primocanes to grow. And they'll grow straight up for the sun. Uh, and it's a lot easier to pick. It's a lot easier to work in this planting where fruit is separated from those primocanes. Now, the rotating cross arm is a relatively new one. And it's, it was actually developed for areas where cold injury is a more of a problem. But with it, you've got a trellis that's movable. And so in the, the first year of the uh, plant growth, we're going to secure the, uh, the primocane on a low wire 
And by doing that, by taking it out of its upright position and tying it down on a low wire, we force it to lateral branch and we capture those lateral branches on a series of wires uh, above it. And then we lay that trellis over here. You can see it on down touching the ground. And if you need uh, some kind of uh, cold protection, you can put a, a mulch or a cover, row cover over that pretty easily. In the spring of the year, we raise that trellis up so it's horizontal uh, with the ground. All of, well, You'll get a, a short shoot that will grow off of those canes that are secured to the wire, and then a bloom come on the end of that short shoot. Well, they'll all be grown up towards the sun, so all the blooms will be on the upper side of that trellis. So after bloom or after we get fruit set and we, we are uh, getting closer to harvest, we rotate, rotate the trellis up out of the vertical and actually over to the other side, about 10 to 15 degrees off vertical. And by doing that, now all of the fruit will be on the underside of the trellis. So you don't have as much sun scald problem. And when you pick it, you're actually picking in the shade most of the time. We see less losses due to sun scald. We see uh, better, well, better productivity out of the harvest labor uh, by using rotating cross arm. Now, it is more expensive to, to build and more labor intense, but it can give you higher yields and higher quality. So it is it's something that is not for everybody, but it may well be what uh, some growers are looking for. And this just shows the uh, different stages. Upper right hand, or upper left, I mean, that primary cane is grown up. We've taken it out of the a vertical position and flattened it out and secured it to a base wire. And it's starting the lateral branch. And those laterals are growing up. And we'll secure them to some of the wires above it. In the fall of the year, we bend it over to the ground, like we'd seen in the previous slide. After bloom, we rotate past the vertical over 10 to 15 degrees out of vertical and we've got fruiting and all the fruit is on one side of the trellis. So harvest is much easier uh, much, and our yields are picking uh, yields are, are a lot higher and it is shaded somewhat. So sun skull is not a problem. Pruning is an important part of, of blackberry or, or raspberry production. Depending on whether you're growing a floor cane crop or a primer cane, pruning can be very different. And we prune at different times of the year throughout the year. So right now, uh, as we go into the winter months, uh, we're gonna be looking at the, the base of this slide. Well, actually we'll be looking at what you see on the right-hand side. You'll have canes that may have a lot of lateral branching. Some of those may be quite long. On up in, in the latter part of the winter, we're gonna cut some of those laterals back to about 12, 18 inches in length, get rid of the ones that are down close to the ground. And by doing that, we increase the size uh, potential for the remaining fruit uh, and we give better sunlight and air movement. If we follow that cycle around to the left, uh, the bo bottom part of this slide uh, shows the floricanes that are blooming and starting to fruit. But we also see a primocane starting to grow. So early in the summer months, we'll, we'll have bloom, we'll get fruiting, we get primocane growth. After harvest, we we'll go to the upper left-hand corner. Uh, we're gonna select the canes that fruited and cut them off at their base. The primocanes, once they get to a certain height, we'll, we'll top them. Uh, and normally I'm looking at topping the primocanes somewhere in the neighborhood of, of five, five and a half feet above ground. I like to top them when those canes are succulent so you can actually just pinch the tip out of the cane as opposed to actually having to use a pruning shear. Because of that, we have to go through the planting several times tipping these canes. But the smaller the wound and the more succulent the tissue is when you top them, the quicker they heal and the less threat you have from cane blight becoming a, a problem in the vineyard or in the planting. Uh, so also by tipping uh, the primocanes, we stiffen them up, make them a little bit more erect in nature, and we force lateral branching. And that, of course, is the big thing. The more lateral branches we have, 
the more fruit potential we've got. And so there's the cycle of, of pruning from winter, uh, early summer, uh, and then we may do some pruning in late summer just to contain some overly vigorous laterals. This shows topping the parma canes where you can pinch them when they're small, when they're succulent. Uh, this is by far the preferred way to do it as opposed to having to come in with pruning shears and cut them. Uh, because cane blight can be a serious problem. If actually, if you're gonna, whenever you pinch or cut, you, it would be good to follow up that practice with a fungicide spray, but it's much, much more important to do it when you're using pruning shears and making big cuts than it is where you have these smaller succulent uh, nips or where you can pinch them off. <coughs> okay, uh, back up here. <laughs> this shows the, the pruning... That is, we let the prime canes grow in the spring. We'll tip them uh, somewhat, and they'll fruit in the late summer and fall. And then we come back in the winter, mow them off at ground level, and start it all over again. So you can see that the pruning sequence is a whole lot easier. Unfortunately, in some areas, the fall yield may not be enough to justify devoting that piece of ground to blackberries. And you may need to go with the fall crop and early spring crop and if our early summer crop. If you do that, the pruning regime is pretty much the same as we saw in the previous slide. Now I was talking with a grower out of uh, Alabama, Northern Alabama, and they're growing uh, some of their primocane bearers for that early summer crop only. That is, they don't want a fall crop. And so they're having to go in uh, and pull blooms to eliminate that fall crop. But they, uh, the reason they're doing it is that the early summer crop is early enough co as compared to the floricane varieties that they think it economically makes sense to do that. So, uh, you know, there are different options you can use. With blackberries, uh, it's important to pick them frequently. You never want to have overripe fruit in the planting. Uh, because you're going to increase disease problems. If you should have spotted wing drosophila, you're going to aggravate that problem significantly. Uh, another thing to be aware of is that we've got a condition in blackberries called red reversion. Uh, if you pick blackberries and leave them in the sun for very long, you're going to see a lot of the berries starting to turn red and they'll develop a bitter taste. So the quicker you can get that harvested fruit out of the sun and into a, a cooler, the better off you are. Ideally, on cold storage, uh, <clears throat> we're trying to get the field heat out. Depends on how long you want. Uh, you're going to need to cool them as to how cold you run that storage. But realize that for about every 15 degrees Fahrenheit that you lower the temperature of that fruit, you can increase the shelf life quite a bit. And here we say four to six times. Uh, ideally, if you do try to store for a longer period, you want to be down in the low 30s and high relative humidity so you don't lose a lot of moisture and have good air circulation within that storage. If you don't, mold is going to be a problem. In many cases, we're looking at uh, storing just a, a, if you have, say, a few berries car carried over at the end of the day, uh, you may want to store them so that you've got some to start to sell the next morning before you, your harvest labor uh, has new berries in. Or in some cases, um, the growers are having to, are freezing any berries they don't sell on a given day. And they're accumulating enough berries that now a winery is interested in purchasing those berries and running a blackberry wine. Uh, blackberry wines sell very well. And so it is a popular thing for the growers to make, or for the wineries to make. Okay, uh, we'll hit blueberries uh, as our last crop. There, if you look at blueberry production in North America, you're going to see references to four different types of blueberries low bush, half high, high bush, and rabbit eye. And actually, now you'll see northern high bush and southern high bush discussed. In Tennessee, 
commercially, we're growing high bush and rabbit eye. Low bush blueberries you'll see primarily up in New England. Uh, those berries are tend to be small. They use them a lot in baking, uh, but not it's not a good fresh fruit one. The half highs are being used primarily as a landscape plant uh, at this time. So I don't know what the future will be, but uh, right now we don't see it in commercial production. But we do grow the high bush and the rabbit eye. And uh, it's kind of interesting in that high bush would make you think that the plant gets quite big, but actually the rabbit eye, if you don't prune it to contain it, will get to be quite a bit bigger than a high bush. So this just shows contrast. Uh, it's a whole lot easier to sell big berries. And the, uh, that's another reason that uh, we don't grow low bush or we select varieties that have bigger berries. Uh, Market-wise, it's a real advantage. So uh, the, uh, the northern high bush, actually, this shows the range that they're grown, but they're going to be uh, most comfortable north of, of Tennessee. If you go much further north than the, the northern border of Tennessee, North, our, our northern high bush is going to be what you'll find in blueberries. Uh, they tend to be, while they're good, and we can grow them here, they have a longer chilling requirement, which means they're a little bit uh, later to, to break bud in the spring. Uh, they're not as prone to frost damage as a uh, rabbit eye. They're also not as prone to cold injury in the winter, uh, although that's not usually a problem. They are, however, more sensitive to soil pH levels, soil organic matter levels, and moisture. So the high bush blueberries in general are much more difficult to grow than a rabbit eye. Why would you fool with them? Well, first off, they'll ripen their fruit about a month ahead of a rabbit eye. And so you've got an early market advantage. We have uh, both in a trial at the Middle Tennessee Station. Uh, and we were picking our high bush, northern high bush, about the first week in June, we'd start harvest. Harvest would go about four weeks. And then uh, when they were tapering off, the rabbit eye were coming in and we'd be picking rabbit eye for the next six to eight weeks. So by having both high bush and rabbit eye, you can extend your harvest season, which is great if you're a pick your own or farm market operation. But that early berry does command more attention and maybe a higher price. The southern high bush was developed by crossing northern high bush and rabbit eye. And the reason they did that is when you go much further south than Tennessee, the northern high bush is not going to do a job. It's, it's chilling requirement. It's too long. They're not going to perform well. And so by crossing the uh, northern with the rabbit eye, the southern high bush gives you a lot of the characteristics of a northern. It ripens early like the northern, but it's more uh, adapted to the, the conditions that growers find further south. So we can grow some varieties of southern high bush in Tennessee. Uh, I like the longer chilling requirement varieties for us. And we've done quite well with some of those in middle Tennessee. Pollination is a, a, a point of con, uh, concern in blueberries. For the most part, the high bush varieties, whether it's a northern or southern high bush, are uh, listed as having self-fertile blooms. That is, you don't need cross-pollination, whereas some of the um, rabbit eye types need cross-pollination. Others, it's not as critical. Be aware that regardless of what type of blueberry you grow, cross-pollination will give you bigger fruit and more fruit. And so if I were planting out northern highbush, I'd have a, a minimum of two or three varieties, and they'd be set up to favor good cross-pollination. The same with southern highbush. With rabbit eye, definitely have multiple varieties so that cross-pollination occurs in the planting. The rabbit eyes are native to the Gulf Coast. Uh, and and uh, so if you go down into South Georgia, Southern Alabama, Mississippi, that was pretty much all they had until the Southern high bush came along. As it stands right now, if you get into the major blueberry region, like in Georgia, and Georgia is the uh, 
Georgia, some years is number one blueberry state in the nation. Uh, other years, Michigan may be, but in Georgia, uh, the southeastern part of the state is the main blueberry area, and they grow southern highbush and rabbit eye. They quite often use the southern highbush for fresh market, and they use the rabbit eye for process market. So uh, that just tells you again about the the value of the crop, southern highbush are earlier, and they tend to have maybe a little bit bigger berry, and therefore the fresh market is, is best for them. But the rabbit eyes are good processors and good on our markets. We've got people that do quite well selling them fresh fruit. So we talked about chilling the, in, uh, with rabbit eyes. Uh, you can get varieties that have a very low chilling requirement. I'm talking 150 to 200 hours. We want to avoid those as much as possible. Uh, about the longest chilling requirement you'll see for a rabbit eye variety is between six and 700 hours. And so we're selecting varieties that have the high end of the chill requirement. So this slide shows uh, Premier at 550 hours, Tiff Blue, six to 700 hours, Part of Blue, uh, five to 600, and a new one called Oak Lotney at 650 to 700. Those are the ones that we would like to have. They're going to give you a better cropping uh, with less threat of frost injury. In Southern Highbush, there are some very low chilling varieties like we talked about in Rabbit Eye, but there are also some that are quite high. And uh, Legacy is one that we've fruited for years at the Spring Hill Station. It's rated at 800, oh, uh, 800 plus hours of chilling. Uh, a newer one named Lenoir uh, is 600 to 800 hours. These are the ones that we'd want to grow with, avoid those low chillers. If we look at Northern Highbush, essentially all the Northern Highbush are going to have 1,000 hours or more chilling requirements. We can satisfy that in Tennessee, but they can't if you go further south. So we've got a lot of options on blueberry production. <clears throat> Blueberries are acid loving plants. Uh, the ideal soil pH is down around five. Uh, I generally talk about a 4.8 to 5.3, but if you look in the literature, it's not uncommon to see recommendations of 4.5 or even lower. Uh, I get a little nervous uh, because I saw a grower uh, push the pH down to 3.9 one time and it, it uh, killed everything. So I like to kind of be up closer to that five range. What we do see, however, is once we start getting a pH up to about 5.3 or higher, iron deficiency is going to start to become an issue. So we need to... Uh, adjust that pH before we plant, and we need to maintain checks to keep it within that desired level. Blueberries do best in high organic matter, 3% uh, or higher, uh, and in well-drained soils. Blueberries are very shallow rooted. Uh, a rabbit eye blueberry, essentially all the root system is gonna be in the upper 10 to 12 inches of soil, a high bush in the upper eight to 10 inches. So they're very shallow rooted. Uh, they will not tolerate wet feet. Blueberries don't have root hairs and therefore they're very poor in their ability to take up water. Uh, and if we set our, our planting upright, we'll get mycorrhizal growth on the blueberry roots that helps with uptake of moisture and nutrients. But uh, because of the nature of the root system on blueberry and that shallow rooting, uh, we use mulches and we'll talk about that in a minute because uh, that will cool the soil and also help uh, stabilize moisture levels. I really like growing blueberries on a raised bed. And the more I, I see it, the more I like it because we can avoid a lot of the problems that we can encounter if we grew uh, uh, at soil level. Uh, if you grow a raised bed, something that's eight to 10 inches high, about four to five feet in width, uh, does make a nice bed. Uh, incorporate organic matter to help uh, make a better site for the, uh, the blueberry and get that pH down there. Now, uh, in selecting material to incorporate or to mulch, we want to make sure we avoid uh, stuff like mushroom compost or uh, 
leaves off of deciduous trees like oak leaves or whatever, because as they decompose, they're going to raise the pH and that's going to give us a problem. And this just shows uh, the root system of blueberry like we've already talked about. It's critical to, to be aware of that shallow root and to take steps uh, to get the plant adjusted and uh, maintain our, our favorable conditions in the root. So that's why, again, I, I raise the issue of raised beds. I think it's well worth the while. If you've got questions about soil drainage, a raised bed will solve that problem. Uh, and uh, blueberries are fairly easy to confine. That is, the roots will go out about as far as the top. So if you build a bed with the specs we're talking about here, you're not going to have a problem with that uh, thing being restricted. <clears throat> mulching essential uh, you'll get better plant survival better fruiting uh, more fruit better quality fruit and uh, of course better new growth and fruit bud development if you've got a good mulch what type of mulch uh, you know if it's an organic mulch pine works good whether it's pine straw pine chips pine bark that works fairly well but we did a trial or actually did several trials on uh, stations across Tennessee over a period of about eight years. And we've had as good a results out of uh, landscape fabric as a mulch as we did out of organic mulch. And so the, the worst case scenario is what you see at the top of the slide, no mulch at all. And the, at the bottom, we're using uh, a pine sawdust and trickle irrigation. Uh, irrigation is very, very, Desirable. It's essential for high bush. It's highly desirable for rabbit eyes. So uh, again, this just shows organic mulch on top, the landscape fabric on the bottom. Uh, we in the trials that we had in, uh, we had uh, no mulch, uh, or six inches of organic mulch, black landscape fabric white landscape fabric, and then black fabric with four to six inch of organic mulch over the top. It became very obvious that there was not a lot of difference from one mulching treatment to another, with the exception that no mulch was clearly inferior uh, for everything. Plant survival, fruiting, uh, growth, just didn't do well without a mulch. Timeline that we look at blueberries just like we showed uh, on on uh, blackberry uh, preparation, and and it may be uh, that we need to devote a little more time to preparation of the site with blueberry than other crops because of the special needs. But realize too that if you plant, say a, a two-year-old plant, and I I think that the ideal blueberry plant to set in the field is a two-year-old plant. I don't like one-year-old plants. I think they're too small. Uh, they need to spend another year in the nursery. But if we set a two-year-old plant, either bare root or container out, it should do fairly well. But I recommend defruiting the plants for the first couple of years. And on a high bush plant, maybe the first three years so that we can get good top growth. It's not uncommon to buy a blueberry plant and have fruit buds on it at the time you set it. If you allow it to fruit, that's going to seriously restrict the growth of the plant. So defruiting in the early life of the plant is important. Um, now, I will say, and it gets a little confusing, we talk about buying a two-year-old bare root or a container plant. When we set it in its permanent location, we call it newborn. And so uh, when we talk about the uh, blueberry planting, we'll say, well, it's one-year-old, two-year-old. Well, that means the age of the plant uh, from setting in the in, the, in its final site, not how old the plant was when you put it out. Um, if you plant dormant or bare root plants, they need to be dormant. I look at, at uh, uh, late February on up into March as a fairly good time to plant. Uh, we want to get them in the ground before it gets hot. You want to have the irrigation system set up and operational, especially if it's high bush, uh, and have a uh, a field that's set up uh, where you've got a good, clean weed and grass-free strip to put the plants so that you don't have uh, competition for moisture and nutrients. <clears throat> as far as fertilizing blueberries, 
Um, we find that, that, again, it goes back to what we talked about right at the very start of this session. The early growth of the plant is supported by stored reserves within the plant. And therefore, putting fertilizer, especially nitrogen fertilizer down too late does absolutely, or too early, does absolutely no good for the plant. Because by the time the plant is able to utilize that nitrogen, quite often it's moved out of the, the root zone of the plant. So with blueberries, we generally say don't fertilize until bloom on the plant. So it's going to be about a month or so after bud break starts. Uh, and then uh, blueberries respond well to ammonium nitrogen sources, not nitrate nitrogen. And so uh, we, we don't want to use something like uh, calcium nitrate as a fertilizer in blueberries. The plants won't like it. They can't utilize it. Uh, probably ammonium sulfate is the most common nitrogen fertilizer we use in blueberry. The reason we select it is it's more acid forming than other forms of nitrogen that helps to prevent the pH from moving too fast. Uh, but it also does give you the nitrogen component that the plant needs. And uh, rather, what we suggest too on, on fertilizing blueberries is use multiple applications of low rates. And so here we're suggesting at bloom, six weeks after bloom, and then 12 weeks after bloom. Light applications over multiple times, the plant will get a hold of the nitrogen better and respond better. If you fertilize, if you got the capability to fertigate, then beginning about bloom, I would probably use some nitrogen in my irrigation water every time I turn the system on. Monitor the soil pH uh, and uh, annual uh, soil checks uh, for that is probably good because uh, the tendency of the pH is it's going to rise above the desired range. And we want to keep it down again, close to five. Annual pruning is essential. Annual pruning starts when you plant and it goes every year of the planting life. <clears throat> so at planting, uh, I remove uh, weak shoots and I also cut off all the fruit buds at that time. Uh, and the, you can see the fruit buds on blueberry quite easily. They're plumper, bigger buds. Uh, and they're at the terminal, the two to four inches of the tip of shoot will be where you see the fruit buds. The leaf buds are smaller, more pointy buds and are further down the shoot. So you can easily identify fruit buds in the latter part of winter and just prune those shoots back to get rid of that crop. After that first year, uh, I like to again defruit them uh, and any weak low shoots uh, on the plant I'll get rid of and try to push that canopy on up into the air. Now, it's possible I say possible, not necessarily desirable, but on a rabbit eye, if you've got very good growth that first year, you might be able to start to fruit it the second year. On a high bush, I would not recommend it. Okay, this slide is obviously messed up, so pardon me for that. On mature plants, uh, pruning time, ideally late winter, uh, so that you uh, can anticipate any cold injury and prune it out. When you prune uh, low growing weak shoots, shoots that are shorter than the growth above them, I like to get rid of. They're gonna be shaded. They're not gonna have much fruit. And if that fruit is down close to the ground, you're apt to have soil splash on it. It's not gonna be good fruit anyhow. Uh, once a blueberry plant gets several years of age on it, we need to take steps to renovate the canopy. And on high bush, that point comes at about the six year of age. What you see is that uh, older canes are gonna lose their ability to have as much fruit and as big a fruit as what they once had. So beginning at about the sixth year of age, I recommend going in and removing about 20% of the canes, uh, starting with the oldest canes if possible, and also select canes at different point in the crown of that plant and cut them back to the ground. In that you open that canopy up to sunlight you'll get new suckers coming from the uh the uh just below the pretty cut and those will be where your best yields will come in the next few years but if we take out 20 percent of the canes every year that means that over a five-year period 
we've completely renovated the crown of that plant and we keep everything with the, within the desired age range for good production. Uh, rabbit eyes are not quite as, as critical, but I still would want to remove like 10 to 15% of the canes each year to regenerate uh, growth. What happens when a blueberry gets too big? And now my, my vision of the ideal blueberry plant is one that's about five feet in height and has a canopy width of between four and five feet. And the reason I like this is that uh, you can pick all the fruit on it. Uh, you, the canopy is, is not so wide that, that uh, you can't reach halfway through to get the fruit. Uh, the top is low enough that even if you're short like I am, you can get the fruit. If you let the canopy get too high or too wide, uh, you're going to see the fruiting zones move up and uh, out of the reach of, of hand uh, pickers and really the birds will be about all that can get it. So keep that plant low. If a plant gets real high, uh, you can sometimes cut them back and, and uh, resurrect that plant. Or what I do in some of that are really out of shape, I just go in with a chainsaw and saw them off few inches above ground and start them all over again. And so if you've got multiple rows that are all overgrown, if you do every other row and let that row that you cut back regrow and, and get on up and, and start to fruit again, and then go back and cut back the, the uh, adjacent rows that, are, um, that need to be lowered. Harvest blueberries, uh, pick only the ripe fruit because a blueberry will not ripen off the plant. Uh, and how do you know when that is? Well, a, a ripe blueberry separates readily from the stem. And so you basically just touch the stem and the blueberry about fall off in your hand. Cool them as soon as you can. Pick several times a week. Don't let overripe uh, berries uh, set on the plant because it's going to encourage problems. Birds can be the major problem and netting may be the only, uh, actually only feasible answer to that problem. If any measure of bird control is used, it's important to start it early. Start before the birds establish a feeding pattern because if you don't, you're not gonna be successful in everything except for possibly netting. And that pretty much runs through the, the production aspects. Uh, and I, uh, unless there are questions you want to answer now, I can turn it over to Les. Be around with us a little bit, Dr. Lockwood. You yes, need sir. to go. I'll okay. be here. While we make the change, or less, if you want to be getting your screen up, uh, Lee had a question, but I, but right after that, I think you answered it. So, Lee, did you get your question answered from Dr. Lockwood? Okay. Yes, Troy. Thank you. I sure did. Right. Thank you, sir. Uh, he had a pH question, but I think you went right to it after he asked the question. So you're you're good. You was, you're reading his mind. You're on top of it, Dr. Lockwood. <laughs> thank you for all that info. We'll move to to Les and then hold the other questions for the end. So Les, thank you for being here. He's going to hit some budgeting and economic things for us on these crops as well. So Les, thank you, sir. Okay, thank you, Troy. Is my screen up there? Yes, sir. Okay. Hey, first off, I want to thank Dr. Lockwood for spending the last couple of days in South Central Tennessee uh, touring, uh, what, about a half, uh, three, four different farms. I know, especially Murray and Marshall County and down in, in Lincoln. Uh, we had the opportunity to visit some, a variety of farms, you know, to say the least. And I know the uh, producers definitely appreciated your information. And uh, the agents that joined us and myself definitely uh, appreciate your information and company. So just thank you again, Dr. Lockwood, for coming down here. Uh, today, what I wanted to kind of cover is I'm not going really in depth with the, the budgeting part of it about berries and, and uh, kind of the takeoff of what Dr. Lockwood went over. Uh, we're just going to look at some of the enterprise budgeting ideas as far as when we're working with, with clientele out in the field and what we kind of want to look for and to help them make the best decision for their operation. You know, what we'll cover here is we'll kind of explain uh, the enterprise budget and the purpose of why we have these and how uh, an individual farm can use those to the best advantage. Uh, we'll learn how to kind of construct them. And then a little bit later on, uh, I want to kind of go over some of the uh, risk managed 
opportunities that we can have with, with producers and also some funding opportunities for those new, new beginning farmers and uh, uh, those that do value added production. So, you know, some of the considerations that we got to keep in mind is, is uh, you know, do you have a market? Uh, it's kind of easy to sell small quantities, some of the back, backyard where maybe where you have a few, uh, you know, 100 feet or, you know, a couple thousand square feet. But, you know, kind of growing bigger than that makes it a little bit difficult uh, when you're kind of comparing it to, uh, you know, the commercial growers. You know, are you going to be able to uh, hit those cost uh, constraints, kind of keep your production costs low enough to, to make it make a go of it? Uh, I know Dr. Lockwood went over with, you know, a suitable site the location. That, that is, of course, critical to, to any operation. And then... One thing I've, I've seen over the last few years is, is going on farm visits is sufficient labor. Uh, oftentimes people kind of start a project, uh, they're all kind of gun ho about it and kind of forget about the amount of labor it takes, especially on like say blueberries uh, um, or blackberry productions. Uh, if it's done right, you're talking about maybe 250 uh, plus hours per acre per year. And then also the course of the capital uh, constraints that we need to, to have to see us through. And, uh, you know, the other consideration is, is, you know, the price and yield. Uh, again, you know, you don't want to be over optimistic about either one, uh, but it does have to go into your, your budgeting and planning for, for your operation. So those other opportunities, like I said, you can do the wholesale market, which is, uh, I think, kind of limited with, with most of the producers that we work with. We're looking more on that on-farm retail or farmer market sales, uh, pick your own. And also some of those value-added crops can be added into jams, jellies, wines. So kind of your seconds, the uh, things that aren't uh, quite as appealing can be had value added uh, going forward in family consumption as well. Uh, you know, it doesn't have to be an acre, it can just be, uh, like I say, a thousand square feet of strawberries or, uh, um, you know, 50 or 100 feet of blueberries, blackberries it can also add to a, a family's uh, uh, own, own budgets and, and uh, kind of reduce those in as well. You know, it's a second or another kind of aspect is, is this is when we work with producers, especially on these new ones moving in with only a few acres. Uh, they're looking as ways to generate a little income, maybe to, to meet their uh, green belt standards, or they want to kind of create a little bit of revenue uh, for some of those farm exemptions that they want to use as far as paying off that tractor or, or getting some of those benefits. Uh, uh, berry crops are a great way to do that because, number one, you don't have to worry about them getting out. You don't have to worry about chasing them. Uh, you don't have to be there every day to feed them. Uh, so this is a good way to uh, kind of generate that income on a small space and kind of get some of those returns better than you would on a conventional uh, agriculture operations. Uh, with any new enterprise or budgeting, we all of us want to make sure that we estimate the cost of returns uh, accordingly and, and as close as we can. Uh, we don't want to be uh, like I say, overly optimistic about the potential returns, as we all know, you know, a few years ago about the health we got excited with that. Uh, when we do look at some of the budgets, whether they're from North Carolina State or Kentucky, they look great on paper. But again, what those returns will be in actuality are two different things. So we kind of want to ask some of those questions about, uh, you know, what happens if the prices are 25% below the estimates or the disease factors or weather factors. Um, you know, we, again, when you kind of look at maybe strawberry production, especially even in, in some of the others, you're not gonna have that peak production every year. Uh, you gotta almost have to factor in about maybe once out of three that you probably won't get much of a yield. Uh, are you able to kind of carry that through? Do you have that sufficient capital or mismanagement uh, pra uh, practice in place to help you through. And also, again, kind of getting back to that labor. Uh, to do it right, it uh, takes the labor. So, uh, so those things have to be kind of be factored in as we look at these um, enterprise operations. And also kind of looking at the, the length of the run. Uh, 
whether it's going to be, you know, what does the payoff when we look at like blueberries, blackberries, especially on the blueberry side, you know, it's, it's five, six years. Uh, the blackberry is a little bit shorter than that. Uh, and then, uh, and then strawberries can be, you know, as close as a year where you start to see some of that payback. Uh, so again, you know, those short cycle runs, uh, maybe some of the way to kind of achieve that pop, uh, profitability quicker. So, uh, you know, having a mix of products uh, a pro that you have on your farm can definitely uh, add to the greater success uh, down the road. So some of those establishment costs we're going to keep in mind, you know, not only site preparation that for uh, what we kind of call kind of year one or pre year one, uh, you know, whether it be footprint on fertilizer, uh, lime, that type of thing, uh, the planting costs, that's going to vary greatly, uh, planting densities, varieties, the quality of the varieties as well. And then the trellis systems, uh, mainly on the blackberry side, uh, there's different ways that can be done. Uh, the other day we were on a farm and he, you know, instead of buying posts, he had uh, ample uh, supply of cedar trees. So he made all his posts out of cedar, a lot of sweat equity going in there. But again, another way to kind of reduce those costs um, overall. And then the irrigation system, uh, it can be, say, fairly low input, you know, $1,500 an acre. But if you have to run water lines or drill a well or have a cistern uh, on the property, uh, pumps, that type of thing could definitely increase those costs. Some of the other considerations, I think one that kind of gets overlooked in the beginning uh, phases of operation is the cooling and storage of, of the crop. Um, having a place where you can kind of, after the field pick to cool those berries down to extend that shelf life uh, is critical. Again, coming back to that story, you know, the cooling units, you can buy commercial ones, maybe they're seven, eight, um, you know, thousand dollars for uh, maybe like an 800 square foot or a little bit smaller. Or again, you know, there's producers out there that are pretty uh, savvy as to where they can look up, uh, whether it be Craigslist or, or new friends and family that might have a business that's gone out, whether it be, and can use some of those uh, insulating panels and cooling units as well. Uh, labeling, shipping. I probably should put in there transportation as well. You know, running back and forth to farmer's markets, it gets costly and time-wise uh, um, and, you know, marketing as well. So kind of some of those considerations that may be factored in. So when we talk about enterprise budgets, we kind of want to break it down from a whole farm perspective. So an enterprise would be, say, blackberries would be one enterprise, blueberries would be another. If you had cattle or hay, those would be their individual enterprise as well. And the reason why we do that instead of doing just a whole farm budgeting is when you have just a whole farm single budget, you don't know what enterprise is actually making you money or losing you money and where changes can be made. So having you know, separate costs and revenue of each of those enterprises can allow you to make an, an, a better analysis of your operation. And also in, in, in developing a a projected cash flow basis on a, on a yearly basis. So again, um, you know, some of these slides I'll probably skip over just for the for the uh, uh, sake of time here. So I'll just kind of look at these here. So again, you know, when we are looking at an enterprise budget, you know, we want to base it on accurate production financial records. Now, when you're doing uh, enterprise budget for something that you haven't grown before. Um, you know, you don't have records to fall back on. So the projections might be off. You might not have the most accurate for your own operation. But again, adjustments can be made to those as well. You know, what you want to do is kind of be in that ballpark of understanding what it's going to cost and the uh, potential revenue on that. And that's one thing, you know, with the, the managed program I work with where we can sit down with, with producers and kind of go through these, these numbers and determine those costs. You know, finding prices on whether it's going to be fertilizer, seed, um, or the plants themselves isn't really that difficult, but it does need to be done in as accurately as possible. So when we kind of Overview, we're looking at some of the resources as far as land, equipment, 
uh, capital labor. Uh, you know, you have a kind of finite uh, access to land and in some places capital uh, equipment. When you do have multiple enterprises, it's a great way to reduce that fixed cost or that overhead cost. You can spread that out through the different operations. Uh, if you just focus on one or a small amount, uh, those fixed costs can be quite high. Uh, kind of similar when we kind of work, work with like cattle budgets. You know, if you have equipment for hay and you only have a, uh, a herd of maybe 40, 50 cows, those overhead costs, fixed costs make it very difficult to, to achieve that uh, profitability. Uh, labor, again, never underestimate the amount of labor that you need. In the beginning, there's everybody was willing to help, but when it kind of really comes down to it, it becomes, uh, the heat of summer in moments, it uh, is, is, can be difficult to kind of have enough labor to help you out with. And as Dr. Lockwood mentioned, as far as, you know, picking some of these crops, you know, it's not a one-time thing. It's multiple days uh, over many weeks during the summer months. So again, having that labor is, is critical. And then capital, this is where we're, you know, when we put together a good enterprise budget, uh, if you need to have an operating loan, you know, taken to your lender, uh, is, is critical to kind of to show them what your plans are and if they're achievable uh, uh, to, to, uh, to have those resources, resources that you need. You know, the saying is kind of always that, um, you know, most of the businesses fail or great percentage because of lack of capital. Well, I think a part of that is, it's not managing that capital well is probably the greater aspect of, of businesses that, that do fail. Um, you know, as far as a crop production system, you know, just having that checklist, the checklist as far as what inputs that you need, you know, all the different herbicides, insecticides, fungicides, um, what is going to be irrigation system, mulching, uh, plastic coming down. We want to make sure that we account for all those as well. Uh, we'll kind of get into other costs with. We'll talk about this a little bit later, but you know, utilities, insurance, um, uh, just just basic uh, general supplies. Oftentimes, uh, you know, we don't really break those per se down into each individual enterprise. We'll just assign a percentage, and we'll talk about that a little bit later here. When we look at these budgets, like I mentioned, whether it's either from the University of Kentucky or Tennessee for a blueberry budget, we want to make sure that we use our own costs, not and uh, in returns and not at someone else's. So again, you know, those estimates are critical for long-term success here. So again, just kind of bear some basic parts of that enterprise budget. We're looking at, of course, the, the input cost and then the, the revenue. So in revenues minus cost, of course, is just simply returns. Uh, bring down some of the you know, explanations of, of the categories. When we look at costs, we're talking about uh, variable or operating cost. Usually those are the items that get used up within that year of operation, whether it be fertilizers, uh, chemicals, that type of thing. Uh, and, and then you have your fixed costs, which would be those overhead, with the equipment, uh, um, land, uh, uh, facilities. So when we kind of think about the variable cost, if you weren't raising anything, you wouldn't have variable costs, but you still would have those fixed costs. Uh, machinery costs can be quite difficult to kind of determine what it is per acre. We have some good charts that we can use to break that down based on kind of hours of operation uh, and assigning each, each crop, uh, you know, their share based on fuel and hours of use. Uh, the last thing here, you know, opportunity cost, uh, that kind of looks at if you're putting your own money into it, it costs something, whether you have it invested elsewhere or in this farm operation. So you do want to include that within the budgeting of, of your operation. Um, owner labor, you know, farmers always have a great way of not paying themselves uh, for the work that they do. So we do want to include your hours, the owner's hours, into a budgeting. Uh, scenario. So if they weren't doing this, uh, maybe they could be doing something else and having that income in. Uh, 
uh, some of the budgets that I've looked through that I thought were really good. Uh, North Carolina State had a great strawberry budget. Uh, Kentucky, uh, friends up there, Matt Ernst has done a lot of work with the uh, uh, blueberry, the blackberry budgets and some blueberries. And that's one that I'll be using here uh, shortly. Um, North uh, Georgia is, is another one. Uh, some simple budgets, uh, Penn State have a, has a few as well that, that are great to use. Another thing I kind of ran across that's a really good tool. I don't have the whole sheet here just for it doesn't show up very well, but the Food Bank of Central New York, they had a sheet that had a conversion of not only blackberries, blueberries, strawberries, but other fruits and vegetables as far as, uh, you know, a quart of blackberries e equals, you know, pound and a quarter to pound and a half pint, um, making those conversions. Because oftentimes when you, when you are doing comparisons, one budget or uh, made, made listed as pounds, another one might be pints or quarts. Well, this is a really handy chart to have even in your offices to, to when you're working with producers to, to uh, put those idea, ideas together um, and uh, make it determine as far as cost, you know, break evens, those type of things. Uh, great tool to have. As I mentioned before, when we kind of break down some of those categories, the direct or variable costs, you can get your seed and fertilizer. Um, crop insurance is another. And we'll talk about a little bit of crop insurance for these non-commodity uh, type of plants. Um, you know, there's USDA and does have crop insurance for, you know, corn and soybeans. Um, they don't have individual insurances for blueberries or strawberries or pumpkins, but they do have one called NAP that we'll talk about a little bit later on as well. So again, you know, the, we're looking for a projection of profit was most, most likely to happen. And we'll kind of take a look here as far as what we have. So under the assumptions here, I'm gonna kind of just kind of concentrate on blackberries, the thornless and wreck. Um, you know, the amount of plants that you have, we're looking at an example here, it's gonna be about 1,588 per acre. And I'm going to use a kind of a uh, more of a long nine row system with 12 feet spacing. Um, when you do an acre, and if you just do a square, you're going to have more ends, which might be a, a positive for you, but also adds a little bit more in cost as far as where you have to start and stop with end post and, and uh, acres, that type of thing. The yield assumptions that we're using here, you know, year one. Um, zero up to your four or five, uh, around about 4,000 quarts. And again, you know, the blackberry, you know, peak production is going to probably ending a uh, year or two after that. And we're looking at a, a, a price that we want to receive around about four and a half dollars per quart. we are include the trellis system, irrigation, and also cold storage within each of these, uh, within the scenario. So we kind of look at it. I have it uh, set up as the prep year and the first year of planting together. So I didn't separate those out, but again, it's a two year process. Uh, looking at some of the chemical fertilizer cost, we could easily probably go back now after we kind of did this and maybe maybe double the chemical cost and fertilizer cost. As, you know, when we look at what has happened in the last two months with those prices, hopefully those will kind of come down in the future. But again, um, that's why yearly projections are so important. Uh, when we do this, uh, it can vary greatly. We're looking at some of the bl pl blackberry plants. Uh, we've got a cost of like two and a quarter each. Uh, you know, again, that can vary greatly with where what you have, whether it's going to be for blackberries or blueberries with, within the operation labor within the first couple of years. And then uh, labor, we're using about uh, $15 for operating labor and about 12 and a half for if you had uh, higher labor brought in. The irrigation system, uh, we're going to prorate that out at about $400 a year uh, over the course of the life of the, the, uh, the set. So we're looking at that, that first year and prep year of an investment around about $6,300. Now add in the trellis system. You know, when we look at it, maybe, you know, 15, 20 feet apart with some of those posts and, and wire. Uh, you know, we kind of come up with a total cost here about $4,000 an acre, which includes some rental for a post driver and also labor costs. We got uh, factored in as well. 
And again, that's a cause that um, we can uh, prorate out as well. One thing I do want to mention as I guess it's probably the good as times any to mention is, is you, know, you can depreciate some of these costs out. So the trellis system, irrigation, and some of those plants themselves where they have a, a life of, of more than in a couple of years. And one thing that the IRS does that's kind of favorable to farms is that you can start to depreciate the year, what they call year of service. So you don't have to depreciate that very first year that the plant, but when you start to harvest, get that revenue in, then you can start to do depreciation schedule. So that'll help aid in lowering you know, your, your raw taxes on that operation. Just kind of keep that in mind. Uh, again, the annual, co annual costs that will factor in, and, we'll, and I'm just going to kind of lump that all together. Uh, if you put it out on a spreadsheet, it gets kind of difficult to, uh, to look at when you factor in all the different fer uh, the fertilizers and all the different uh, pest control products that you would have. So we just kind of look at it, kind of keep it simple here uh, when we look at an overall projections. So that first uh, cropping year or fruiting year, those variable costs, that's going to be labor, uh, the fertilizer, chemical, mowing, uh, pruning, all those type of costs are going to be uh, lumped in into the variable cost. The fixed cost, again, is going to be coming back to, to pay for the, uh, the trail system, also like a cooling system you're going to have, so we'll prorate that out, land and taxes, uh, and then also interest. So we want to make sure we got some of that interest expense in there. So your total cost of that first year, uh, cl getting close to about 9,000 uh, revenue. We're just gonna be based that off that first year of, of just maybe, I think it was like 800 uh, quarts or so. Um, so we do have a little income coming in. Uh, we're still kind of based on that first year return of fruiting, um, you know, in the negative of $5,000, but we are, again, making progress going forward. But again, you know, having these projections, knowing what you would need to have an op operating loan or, or some extra capital to see it through for those first few years. The second year, uh, variable costs, some of those are going to be dropping down a little bit, You're not going to have as much as, as, as uh, uh, work, with work, but you do have a lot with um, labor and also uh, packaging. If you have it put it into a clamshell uh, for a for selling, you know, again, that's going to be maybe 15 cents, 20 cents per, per pack cost. So you want to make sure those are included in uh, farmer market costs. You know, if you have to pay to go to a farmer's market or, or um, selling even on your own property. So we make sure that we got those in. Uh, the, the revenue from that second year, um, that kind of, kind of gets laid out a little bit more as far as what we mentioned, as far as the amount of a pride that you can have. So we can see that the total returns from the second year of fruiting, um, uh, we're starting to see a little bit of a running in the black at this point, but we still have an, the establishment cost, the crude over the, the last four years, about $9,800. Uh, the break even is that third fruiting year, which would be about year uh, six in this case. Uh, as you can see, you know, we still have those variable costs going to be great uh, interest, but again, uh, getting into maybe that 8,000 quart, hopefully uh, production where we can kind of see some of those uh, returns coming back into play. In fourth year and beyond, uh, you know, it's reasonable to see on, it, on an acre where you do have some of a profit or what we call return to management, about, you know, $11,000 per acre. Again, you know, these are kind of projections, but those are the opportunities that we do have uh, for a small amount of land. So when we kind of look at it that way, uh, I know you have a much greater input cost for a small area, but comparing it to, you know, putting cattle out there or trying to do hay or, or some more conventional, you can see that, um, you know, there are opportunities for a small farm uh, operations. Uh, just to kind of go over briefly on, on strawberry budget, this one was from North Carolina State and from Dr. Gina Fernandez. And that kind of gives a, a good overview as far as uh, marketable yields. Now, like I said before, uh, I've worked with some growers here in South Central Tennessee where 
one year they'll have a great crop next year it's about half uh, the third year, hardly anything at all. So we wanna make sure that we're not overly optimistic when we look at the pounds per acre that we have and having sellable uh, a crop. Uh, you know, I looked over a number of different budgets from different area universities. Uh, you know, that net revenue, again, before, uh, you know, management line cost, you're looking at, you could be in that, you know, $14,000 acre. Uh, I think that's probably a little bit high, but when we look back at the material, materials every year, we're talking about plastic, putting down, uh, prepping that soil, the plants. Typically, uh, a lot of the commercial growers, you know, it's only a one-time thing where you plant for one year or you have one harvest and you're pulling out and putting something out, uh, uh, replant in the fall. So again, a lot of labor intensive, uh, cost intensive operations here. Uh, you know, prorating other costs, uh, again, like I mentioned with the pro rate, you know, we kind of just take it as a simple um, math. You know, if it costs, uh, you know, two thousand dollars per irrigation system in uh, running those plastic lines, and it's good for four or five years, we want to just kind of divide that by five to kind of get that pro that uh, um, pro rated costs. Kind of similar to what we do for doing pastures or hay grounds as well. Again, those other costs, transportation, marketing. Uh, you know, I've worked on a number of different value added where the transportation and marketing are way, way underestimated. So we want to make sure that those are factored in accordingly. Uh, the break even yield, you know, again, this is a gr great one to kind of look at as far as we kind of look at, uh, you know, your total cost, if it's going to be $7,000 an acre. and uh, you project 2,500 quarts that you know that the break even price is $3. So anything above what you get marketing wise of $3 uh, can be factored in. Um, it's again, a great way of uh, a sales or marketing tool to kind of see where you need to be at. And if you're gonna be a player in the game, you know, are you gonna be cost effective? If it's gonna be costing you say $5 a quart and at the farmer's market, uh, you picks are only for three dollars, it's gonna be kind of hard to justify going forward with the operation uh, to call up, cover all your expenses. Now, with that said, not all operations make money, but they may add a lot of value to your overall farm production, you know, your farm, uh, your whole farm plan. It's kind of like a, even though you may not make as much money or maybe a little bit say loss say in blueberries versus strawberries it, you know having that additional product to sell you know kind of completing the whole product array so to speak um, goes a ways to increasing sales and covering some of those other expenses especially the the overhead the fixed costs so when we allocate some of those overhead costs, it can kind of be difficult to break it down by enterprise. And the best way to do that is kind of looking at Schedule F and looking at, uh, you know, whether it's membership dues, insurance, some legal fees, uh, just supplies in general, just kind of add those all up and just do a percentage across each enterprise. So if, if um, you know, blueberries are 50% of your enterprise, uh, strawberries, blackberries, 25, then you just, you know, 50, 25, 25. It's an easy way to do it. Again, uh, just as looking at a Schedule F form here, uh, very easy to, uh, to uh, get some of that information off. However, one thing I really, uh, you know, press with the producers I work with that it doesn't, Schedule F form doesn't tell much of a story. It kind of tells you, you know, what you sold and uh, what your expenses was, but it doesn't really break down where that money is being made and successfully. Um, in the few minutes that we have left here, I want to kind of just kind of go over managing some of that product risk or production risk. You know, that can be done with crop diversification, uh, enterprise diversification, you know, spreading it out over multiple uh, uh, systems. So if there's a failure one in one area, you know, the other ones can maybe um, buoy it, the rest of the operation. Extending that production season, as Dr. Lockwood mentioned, you know, the different varieties uh, that you have, whether it be early, late, 
seasoned producers. You know, strawberries is a good example as far as having something that comes in early in the year where labor can be dedicated to that as the blueberries, blackberries come in. You know, you, you can look at a three, four month uh, period where you do have that revenue sources and harvesting coming in. So it gives it that additional sales opportunity. Uh, we'll talk a little, I'll talk a little bit about the uh, non-insured crop disaster assistance program called NAP through FSA, and also some grant and cost sharing funding opportunities uh, to, for our producers. Not sure how many people have, have heard of the NAP um, program. Uh, this is available to, again, those crops that are not what I call commercial that have that uh, crop specific crop insurance like corn, soybeans. So if you wrote, grow pumpkins, uh, blueberries, blackberries, uh, sweet corn, that type of thing, you can apply through FSA. Uh, and it's based on, uh, they charge basically $350 per crop. And it doesn't matter how many acres you have. Uh, now, if you have three or four different crops, they'll charge three. 325 each up until I think a max of maybe like $900 per, per county that you're in. Now, the way that it's paid back is that it's based on the crop acreage, uh, the yield that is uh, normally achieved or from their rates that they have in net production. So it's based on if you have a loss of over 50%, uh, they pay back 55% uh, of that loss. Now you can purchase more insurance or pay up uh, if you want to take that, um, say, gamble or risk if, if you want to, or if you feel that your production is much better than what is normally calculated. So if you do have a crop failure, it's not that you're going to get 100% back of what was marketable, that marketable price, but it does give you the opportunity to kind of meet some of those production costs and kind of give you a footing that way. Um, there's a lot of different factors involved. However, I think this is a great way when you look at, for instance, strawberries that where you can have a five or $6,000 $1, investment per acre per year, having some of that insurance to, pay, to uh, protect your operation uh, would be a great idea through FSA. Another kind of want to just cover is some of those grant and cost share funding opportunities. When we look at uh, one that I've worked with in the past with some other, with a handful of producers with the value added producer grant, which is a federal program through USDA. Um, here I have worked with one that received $250,000 of cost share, others cost close to $100,000. Now with those value added producer grants, in most cases it doesn't, pay for say infrastructure or equipment or buildings, but it does pay labor, uh, processing costs, advertising, some transportation. And uh, usually those are based over a three year period of use. So again, even though it may not pay for equipment that you would want, uh, that money that you would spend on labor could be saved through the value added producer grant and maybe focused more toward the equipment. It is a lengthy process. Um, you do have to have a business plan. I've done some feasibility studies where that were added to the grant uh, to be successful. But when you look at dollar amounts of $25,000, $50,000, uh, your time can be quite valuable <laughs> in return. Uh, the second one, uh, the Tennessee Ag Enterprise Fund, again, through the state of Tennessee. Uh, it's Sounds a lot like the TAP, but quite different. Uh, this is more for that value added. Um, a lot of the producers that have received these have been uh, uh, creameries or wineries and uh, uh, sawmills, where they're adding value not only to their own uh, operation, but to surrounding operations as well. So when you think about like a sawmill, where they kind of went together, they're increasing the value of that timber in their area by adding value. Uh, it could be looked at as again, you know, adding value to berries. So if, you know, if you're looking for uh, a cooling or a storage facility, or maybe some processing piece of equipment, this can be funded through that. 
Um, some people that have received this fund have uh, done meat processing where they've, uh, you know, the enterprise fund had paid for their cold storage trailer uh, to haul their meat back and forth. Uh, we'll look at uh, Tennessee Ag Enhancement Program, uh, application B, the producer diversification. That one can be up to about $12,000 cost share. And with our growers, especially on that uh, berry side, uh, it covers a, a lot of different processing equipment, advertising, that type of thing. So when you're looking at a getting the equipment and facilities that uh, producers need to add that value, capture that secondary uh, revenue. You know, it's great selling fresh, but if you're able to add additional value to you know, your seconds uh, into jams, jellies, wines, that type of thing, um, it's an opportunity not to pass up. So kind of in summary, uh, you know, we want to allow our producers to evaluate the efficiency of different operations through to those enterprise budgets. We want to make sure that you know all is allocate all the cost and revenues uh, consistently through across those enterprises, and use your own numbers. And that's where, again, uh, I'd be happy to, to uh, visit with any producer as far as really honing in on what their costs are going to be. It varies greatly uh, through each operation and uh, allocating those overheads and and uh, not relying on Schedule F's. Um, to make those decisions as far as what's going forward. So with berry production summary, uh, you want to identify some of those tan tangible assets that you can use. That'd be kind of land equipment that you have. Um, also look at some of those regulations as far as what you can do on your own, own land. You know, are you able to have a, say a farmer market stand? Are you able to do commercial agriculture? You know, it might be berries. You want to make sure that within your your um, county or even in, within your HOA some, in some areas are you able to do this. So uh, detail that production system out, uh, you know, it gets kind of confused or frustrating when you're working with someone where it's just kind of just, a, on, they overgeneralize since they want to do a very production. They want to get going. They think they can make money. Well, it's much more to it than that as we all know. And I think most importantly, just kind of looking at access to human resources, not only labor, but also um, educational resources and experience as well. Uh, here's the references that I used with the, uh, uh, mentioned that Matthew Ernest from the University of Kentucky had some great information and also the farmer's tax guide. Um, IRS publication 225 is a great resource. Um, to determine what can be farm exempt, what can be sales exempt and written off. So again, some great resources there. So that's all that I have. Uh, if you have any questions, please let me know. I'd be happy to answer them or you know, visit later on, on with you in your counties on this matter. All right. Thank you, Troy. Hey, Les, thank you very much, sir. Uh, and Dr. Lockwood as well. Um, a lot of information there and I, I know we're past the two hour span, but uh, I do appreciate Dr. Lockwood and Les for, for providing all this information to us. Um, we will open for questions. If I'm, some of your, many of you are still on the call and I appreciate that. We had a good number on anywhere from 25 to 27 on the call this morning. Uh, so I'll open up for any questions anybody might have. Hey, Troy, right off the bat, I've got one quick question for Les uh, and this may, Dr. Lockwood too. You mentioned uh, the number of labor hours that you figured on fruit production around 250 hours. Uh, how's that kind of compare with like vegetable production? More, less, about the same? Well, I'm not sure, Greg. I I would think that would vary greatly with, you know, what do you mean by, you know, vegetable production, you know, which... Uh, you know, tomatoes, that type of thing. But when you look at it, when you, you know, I kind of, when I, you know, work with people, I tell them, you know, stand out on the middle of one acre and look around and think of what you have within your garden, how long it takes. Uh, it can add up quickly. So I don't have an answer for that, unfortunately, but uh, I don't, maybe Doc, Dr. Lockwood does here. 
I, I don't have any real good numbers either. I would expect that the fruits are going to be higher uh, simply because you got things like pruning and so on that uh, are fairly time consuming but and have to be done every year that would add to it. So I would expect them to be higher. Well, along those same lines then, uh, how does the, the labor hours, if a person's figuring this, compare maybe from a, a blueberry as opposed to an apple or some of those? I know there's difference in hours, but you know, when when I visit and talk with people and I start telling them, you know, hey, you need to you need to be figuring on, and I'm glad Les threw that out. I, you need to be figuring on about 250 hours a year in terms of labor within this. I, I think that kind of gives them at least a ballpark figure to be thinking about how many, how much time that fruit crop's going to have. And especially if you start saying, okay, now you got five acres of that and you were planning on doing this by yourself, uh, you, kind of emphasizing how much labor you'd need beyond just your labor. I agree with what you said on that, Greg. I, I guess one of the things, and I don't have any real good solid information on it, but that's certainly one of the things I think about when uh, we talk about, you know, start small, learn as you go. Uh, and that's one of the things they're gonna be hopefully assessing how much they can really handle. Uh, it's, um, cause it's, there's so much variation, I think in, in the way people do things that that labor uh, figure is going to be very well very widely but uh, I don't have any really solid numbers I that I could quote yeah I, I, don't, I don't either so but you can tell a difference of those that put the hours in and those that don't put it that way Thank you, Greg. Still like that background you got, Greg. <laughs> any, any other questions anybody's got? Carla asked, can we get a copy of the presentations? Um, I want to ask the same thing because I hope we, this is what we're going to put in some of the things we're doing uh, later on. But uh, Carla, when I get those up, I can send those out. Doc, that's okay with you and Les? By all means, yes. Gotcha. Yeah, Thank Troy, you. Troy, hey, yes. to kind of add to that, I'd ask Les. I know he skipped over a bunch of stuff, and there was some really good stuff in there. Uh, I, I wouldn't mind even having another copied version of that if you wanted to go back and discuss some of that stuff that you actually skipped over in your presentation, because I think there was a lot of good information there that uh, I'd, I'd like to maybe heard you talk about. Okay. Yeah, we'll send these out. Hey, Dr. Thank Lockwood, you. are there like just family farm operations? Do you deal with any as you go across the state that maybe has both high bush and, and rabbit eye berries, strawberries? Have their system set up like that where they have smaller acreages of each, but they're able to spread their their available family labor out? over the whole summer because I know when you get into the H2A workers, that's you've opened up a huge can of worms. A lot of people, they they don't even want to start going down that road. Yeah, um, we deal with several people that are going to have multiple crops and try to handle it themselves. And some of those people are, are doing uh, things while they, they may try to say, go pick your own. Uh, with some of it to take away some of that labor crunch and harvest time. That takes a lot of hours to do several different things, you know, like pruning and so on, but harvest is pretty timely. And so if they, if they could use something like pick your own to uh, help with the harvest time, then they may be more able to take care of the rest of it themselves without having to hire additional labor. So there are some that try to to use multiple crops, yes, but do the work themselves. Any others? 
I'll ask one last question. Uh, sure. Dave, on the uh, primocaine and taking those out, uh, I know you and I have talked about this in the past, and I know you did some research here a few years ago on the plateau about just mowing those off and doing only a fall harvest. Uh, have we got any research in terms of kind of what those yields are, and figuring those into a crop budget as to, you know, people truly from a commercial scale, like here on the plateau, looking at doing just that fall harvest and kind of what the yields would be and how that would impact budgets. Because I, I think that's a, re that's a, a real, real potential uh, crop for here on the mountain and harvesting those from August into uh, October. I don't have any really good, what I would have much confidence in as far as good figures on that. No, uh, I'd like to see it, but I'm not aware of it. Anything else from anyone? All right, if not, we'll bring this to a close. Thank you for staying overtime and uh, we'll get the presentations to everyone and, and uh, when we get all these sessions done, I'll get you the links to those if you can use those in any way or need to review them. So Dr. Lockwood, thank you, sir. Uh, Les as well for being on here today. You're and uh, we will thank bring you, it to sir. a close. Uh, next one is January the, where's my note? 13th, I think, uh, on, on tree nuts. Thursday, January 13th, 9 a.m. Central. On tree nuts so uh, go to super if you want to uh, get on that as well so thanks for the comments and uh, thanks for joining us today and we will sign off thank you all well, take care merry christmas merry christmas <laughs>